Mayor Brainerd in Carmel, who's an incredible leader, um, is a design junkie and a design firm junkie, and he'll bring in anyone who will work with him who he sees as innovative. And so uh, I created the plan, which I can tell you about, but uh, Jan Gale's firm took my plan and changed it, mm -hmm. um, not in ways that change its function, but I think they made it a lot prettier and a lot sexier and, um, and nicer. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman, and that was Jeff Speck, author of Walkable City and Walkable City Rules. I had this conversation with Jeff just a couple of weeks ago and wanted to get it right out to you because we talk about a couple of really cool things that are happening soon, including a class that he is teaching at Harvard that you'll wanna join. So without further ado, here's Jeff Speck. I'm so delighted to have in the Ecamm studio here with me today, Jeff Speck. Jeff, welcome. Happy to be here. Jeff, uh, we're broadcasting out uh, to, not live, but you know, to a, a, an international audience. I'm thinking that there's at least two or three people out there that don't know who you are. <laughs> well, what's your elevator pitch in terms of like, this is who I am, I'm Jeff Speck. How long you got? Ah, you, 30 seconds, this is an elevator pitch. <laughs> Perfect, how tall is the building? So I'm, I'm a city planner who was trained as an architect and I always thought I would become an architect. Um, but at a certain point, as I was studying architecture, I became aware of what became eventually known as, as the new urbanism and realized that uh, design could have a much greater impact, does have a much greater impact on people's quality of life at the scale of the community. So I, I very quickly reoriented um, my practice towards um, uh, creating uh, new places and improving existing places with the goal of, of making them uh, more livable. And through my career, I've come to realize that that means more walkable. So in conjunction with doing this work uh, and making places more walkable or trying to make places more walkable, um, I've written a number of, of books that are, that are pretty well read on that subject. My best known is called Walkable City. Uh, I also wrote a book called Walkable City Rules uh, more recently. Um, but the book that kind of got me really into this movement is called Suburban Nation. And I wrote it with my mentors, Andre Stuani and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, who are the ones that really opened my eyes to this conversation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned new urbanism, so that's that's how we know each other. Is is uh, you know when uh, <laughs> I almost said every year we meet up at CNU, but this almost. is the first time we've met uh, since uh, uh, 2019. And so uh, it was wonderful to reconnect with you in Oklahoma City uh, for the Congress for New Urbanism, which was just this past month, and. Um, I just had this comment, uh, you know, come up on YouTube uh, on the video that I produced and, and published today with Victor Dover. And uh, it was a, a person from, I believe, the Netherlands who, who has said new urbanism, question mark. You know, <laughs> what is that? This looks like traditional development. Talk a little bit about that. You were at the cusp of, of the new urbanism movement, correct? What, how did it get that name? Because it really does look like traditional yeah. development. Well, first we called it traditional town planning, and that turned off the uh, liberals, of whom I count myself. Uh, then we called it new urbanism, and that turned off uh, some of the conservatives. But <laughs> if you look into it uh, and see what it is, it's something that pretty much everyone can get behind. I have to say that by reframing it within the rubric of walkability, I've found a much more, uh, um, a larger and more accepting, less critical audience um, than by using the term new urbanism. But I make it clear to anyone who will ask that I am a card carrying uh, new urbanist. Um, sometimes people say, why do, you, why do you call it new urbanism? It's just urbanism. And right. my answer is, well, you know, people screwed up urbanism for so many years um, that we had to reinvent it. I mean, we had to bring it back. Right, and, we, we um, lost it, you know. We, we, yeah, we lost it. Yeah, yeah, we, we so lost it's, it. It's, yeah, it's a new, it's a return, it's a return to urbanism that doesn't roll right. off your your tongue quite the quite the same way. Right. Um, I would call myself a second generation new urbanist in the sense that I was about 15 years behind okay. um, folks who really created it. Um, but I was there present at the creation of the Congress for New Urbanism, uh -huh. okay. which was the brainchild of principally six uh, architects um, on both coasts, including Andres and Liz, my mentors. Um, 
when uh, when in, in 1993, I had just gotten out of architecture school and joined their firm. And I joined their firm because they were the design firm in the country that I thought was doing the most exciting work at any scale. Yeah. Um, so actually when Andres and Liz and Peter Calthorpe and Daniel Solomon and Liz Mool and Steph Polizoides all said, hey, let's create this um, conference. Um, Andres wrote a first draft as to why it was important and mm -hmm. why people should come. And I got to edit that. <laughs> that was the first, the first New Urbanist writing I did probably was that invitation right. to the first Congress, which was in 1993. Wow. Um, wow. And there have been 30, 30 Congresses since. Yeah. And um, it started out as principally a movement among designers right. and essentially designers saying, hey, um, I don't care, you know, how much st statistics you have and how many good policies you have and, and um, how much arrow and asterisk planning you might do in your comprehensive plan. Unless you've got physical design and urban design at the table, you're not going to produce the outcomes that you that you want. Um, and of course, the Congress grew necessarily, I would say, to its credit. Uh, it grew to to embrace and include um, not just designers, but a ton of of um, public servants, um, a ton of developers, right. uh, engineers, um, uh, and of course all of the design professions, from landscape to architecture to um, urban design. And um, you know, it's a little bit frustrating to me sometimes to go to the conferences and see actually a very limited number of the sessions now are on design. They used to be almost all on design, mm -hmm. but I realize that's for the, that's for the good of the movement that we've right. enlarged the tent and that we're actually putting our hands on the, um, on the levers of power that are causing change to happen in cities. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned suburban nation. Um, you know, we, we have the cover of uh, walkable city up right now, um, which was the, the first of your, your books when you really started diving in on walkability. Suburban nation was my entry into uh, the urbanism movement. Um, and, and I came to it a little bit late in, in, in my career in the sense that um, I had already been, uh, you know, sort of in the disease prevention, health promotion uh, genre or environment for, for quite some time. And I was just starting to make that transition of looking at health in the built environment. And so uh, Suburban Nation was one of the first books that, you know, I really... That, that sent me down into the urbanism, uh, the new urbanism rabbit hole, uh, so to speak. And uh, so, so this, is, this is the book that was just phenomenally successful, I would say. Um, I, I remember when you published it, I, you know, watched people, you know, respond to it. I, of course, had my copy, you know, as soon as it was hot off the press. Uh, it, it, why, why did this resonate so much for people? Well, I think um, let's just step back a little bit and sure. just say that the fact that you have some gray in your hair um, means that, yeah, you're one of the suburban nation people. And when I go to conferences, people come up to me and uh, I mean, literally at least once a day at, at whatever conference I'm at, someone comes up to me and says, thank you for either suburban nation or for walkable city. Uh, right. It's why I became a planner. And I say, well, first of all, my apologies. <laughs> but secondly, um, the, for suburban nation, someone like you, I always am, am clear to say, you know, the experience you had reading that book that flipped a switch in your head is the experience I had in 1989, um, hearing Andres give his classic talk on towns versus sprawl. Right. And the story was just the best story I'd ever heard. It just hit home in so many ways. It articulated and made clear a number of thoughts that were very inchoate and, and unclear in my head. Um, and, um, explained why we love certain places and hate other places, explained why it wasn't possible to build any more of the places that we love right. in America, um, and talked about uh, what we could do to change that. Uh, and that, that was such a powerful message, and that's what really got me into the movement. Yeah. Um, when younger people uh, um, encounter, you know, are, are nice to me at conferences, they, they tend to have, of th their gateway drug was Walkable City. Right. I would say Suburban Nation, I think, was the best-selling planning book of its decade, which came out in 2000. Walkable City has been the best-selling planning book of its decade, came out in 2012, Okay. principally by virtue of being a book that's written for everyone. Right. Right? Right. So it isn't necessarily that there's stuff in Walkable City that is more sophisticated or uh, uh, more cutting edge or, or more insightful than what you find in, in a dozen other books that were published at the same time. Right. But it was created... Um, very much in, you know, 
uh, hopefully artful nonfiction prose um, to be eminently readable right. and, um, and, and super fun to read and deal with these issues in ways that, they're, that, that they would win the hearts and minds of someone who hadn't necessarily had any introduction to planning before. Right. So what happened is folks in, folks in their communities um, who are trying to make these changes, they read the book, they have kind of their own aha moment, or it's saying in convincing ways that mostly I learned from other people, it's saying in convincing ways things that they've been challenged convincing others of, and they say, it's a tool I can use. Um, and I've been to many places where literally, and these are the cities I like arriving in, literally it's been distributed already to 50 or 100 people before I get there. Right. We just did a book. We, I did a talk in Wausau, Wisconsin, which is a really nice town, kind of in central northern Wisconsin. Um, and as is usually the case, after the book talk, there was a book signing and no one bought the book. And I'm like, why is no one buying the book? It turned out they already had the Everyone yeah. already had the book. <laughs> but but the, the uh, bookstore bookseller who had watched my talk bought the book mm-hmm. and the bartender bought, my, bought the book. And I'm like... I'm doing something right if the bartender buys the book. There you go. There you go. Well, the other book that, that was so influential for me, too, uh, was uh, was Kunstler um, in yeah. the Geo- Geography of Nowhere. And uh, so it was just it was very, very influential at, at that for me at that time to be able to to make that connection uh, between the built environment and how it encourages, um, you know, a healthier way of life, you know, being able to naturally encourage physical activity and movement. And as a classically trained scientist in, in exercise physiology and as a behaviorist um, that is you know, trying to encourage healthier behaviors, um, it was it was wonderful to actually start, you know, seeing that impact that the, the built environment has on our well-being and so many different ways. And so then you, you decide, okay, I have to follow this up. I have to come up with another book. <laughs> and I find it very funny, and, and, and I know you get a chuckle out of this too, is that you came up with 101 Steps. Why is that funny? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's brilliant from a cla- from you know from a marketing perspective, and you know, you know why a hundred and one? Why not only a hundred? But yeah, I mean, well, I, I had a Dalmatian growing up, so that that might uh, that might be the explanation. But yeah, um, I was aiming at a hundred and one. I wasn't aiming for a hundred. It wasn't like <laughs> I had an extra. Although it turned out I did have an extra, and I had to consolidate two into one. Uh, it was a hundred and two. Um, but yeah, I think. You mischaracter not, not intentionally. You mischaracterize it slightly, which is I never say I have to come up with another book. Right. What happens is I finish writing a book, and p- people ask me, "Do you enjoy writing?" And I say, "I enjoy having written." Like writing is right. so hard. Right, right, right. If you're me, it's like so hard and so slow and such a grind. Um, but at the end of the effort, even at the end of each day, yeah. If I've done a good job and I go back and read what I've done, that's very gratifying. If it turned out, um, but. Um, I, when I finish each book, I'm like, I don't see how there's anything else I could possibly have to write. Right. And uh, I'm done. You know, my, yeah. my, uh, my oeuvre is complete. <laughs> well, but and, what happened and, and was, I have my copy I, right here. And you, yeah. I, I appreciate you, you making that, uh, that clarification. Well, um, let me, let me continue. I mean, yeah, what happened do, is, yeah. what happened is that um, I realized after, six years, because this came out in 2018, so maybe I realized mm-hmm. af- after four years, um, that while Walkable City was great at indoctrination and convincing people uh, of the importance of these issues, uh, it left people a little bit stranded in terms of actual um, physical design choices that, right. they, uh, that they faced. Right. Um, a number of people pointed out that Walkable City has no pictures, which actually is, I think, key to its success. When we were writing Suburban Nation, Vitold Rubczynski, who's probably the most widely published architectural uh, author in the U.S., mm-hmm. um, advised me to have no pictures in Suburban Nation. And I had said, uh, uh, that's a great idea, but we can't do it with this because the whole book's placed uh, built upon a damn slideshow, right? So Suburban right. Nation had to have pictures. Walkable City, though, I took him up on that advice, um, but then... Uh, there's just a whole bunch of diagrams and charts and and images and other things um, that are necessary if you if you're going to learn how to do this stuff yourself. Right. So while uh, Walkable City was created to uh, um, to to build the tent, you know, to grow the tent, 
um, uh, walkable city rules was very much created for either professionals or hardcore a- advocates, hardcore hobbyists, but people right. who are doing the work or want to be doing the work to basically teach you how to do what we do. Right. And, you know, one of the amazing things that distinguishes, I think, the new urbanism from many movements is it's always been, it, it's, its first practitioners have always been extraordinarily generous in sharing techniques, giving things away for free, letting other people take credit, uh, you know, not taking credit, pushing it forward. Um, and honestly, um, you know, the only way we're going to succeed in changing the built environment and the only way we have succeeded to the degree that we've gotten, which could be so much better, um, is by not jealously guarding anything. So my, my goal with Walkable City Rules, and I say this in the introduction, is, um, you know, if you read it once, you'll know more than most municipal planning officials. I'm sorry, because most of them aren't trained. Right. Um, if you read it twice... I forget what I say, but you'll basically be an expert. And then if you read it three times, open your own city planning consultancy. Cause it's really, it's like everything I know. Right. And I often get, even today, you know, students write me and um, uh, ask questions and you do want to respond to the questions, but I'm, I'm just cutting, I, I respond, but I'm, I'm cutting and pasting pages from the book because literally there's more in that book than, than is in my brain. Cause I've forgotten some things since I wrote them and it, it tries to actually uh, have everything in it. Right. Yeah. If I were to summarize the two, I would say the first one was the why and the second one was the how. Uh, That's fair enough, except that, um, you know, that's the organization of Walkable City without Mm -hmm. pictures is the first third of Walkable City is why it's so important. Mm hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to return to both of these. The first, the first part is why it's so important. And then actually the second part is 10 steps of walkability, Mm -hmm. which is 10 hows, you know, from planting more trees to, uh, to, uh, creating great bicycle facilities to, um, you know, not letting cars determine the shape of the built environment. And it's, it's actually, it is how, but it's not, uh, it's not a how for professionals. It's how for, for armchair urbanists, as we call them. Um, so, the um, the first part, the why of Walkable City, I learned a ton from folks like you, you know, who are active in epidemiology and public health. Right. And actually, the three the three main whys are health, wealth, and sustainability. And of course, I had the benefit of reading and and learning from face to face Frumpkin. Um, uh, I'm sorry, oh, probably He's such Jackson. a normal name. Dick Jackson and uh, Frank, Frumpkin Dex- Jackson and Frank, who wrote yep. um, Urban Sprawl and Public Health in 2004, yep. um, learned so much from them that really almost the entirety of the health chapter is with their permission and their edit cribbed yep. from their yep. book. And, and Dick um, was and my imposed, mentor too, so yeah. Yeah, great. And he's amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the economic... Logic. A lot of it comes from Chris Leinberger, mm-hmm. um, who wrote. Um, oh, damn! I'm so bad. At it. It's been such a long time. But he wrote. Um, I forget what Dick Le- what Chris Leinberger wrote, but look it up. Um, and um, uh, and it's featured very heavily in the book. And then uh, the environmental chapter. A lot of that came from David Owen, who wrote Green Metropolis, which is an oh, amazing right. book. Yeah. That was- was initially going to be called Green Manhattan, but then they realized they could, because it's really about New York and how incredibly sustainable New York is compared to almost anywhere else in the country in terms right, of people's right. carbon footprint. Um, but he realized it was a much larger conversation, and that book was incredibly informative. But, you know, I made an effort basically to to learn from everyone I could and then organize all of their arguments around that one goal, which is making our cities more walkable. Yeah. And as you can see, I I pulled up uh, the 10 steps for for walkability, which I knew was uh, on this particular uh, website, which I already had up so that uh, Chris Leinberger's book is called Chris Leinberger's book, I believe, is called The Option of Urbanism. Perfect. I believe The Option of Urbanism. And I'll make sure that uh, and I'll make sure that we include links uh, in the show notes and in the video description uh, down below for all of these wonderful books that we have uh, referenced already. And I'm sure there will be more. So uh, do you want to say a few words about uh, our, our top 10 here, the 10 steps? Well, I, th- I think that it's a little bit random how some of these parts got grouped with each other. I'm just looking at the list. Um, uh, Donald Shoup's book, 
the high cost of free parking yep. was amazing. And he writes so well. I don't know if you've read it. He's oh, a yeah. really entertaining I, I, writer. I've read it and, and uh, the Shoop but Dog was, has been a, a guest here yeah. on the podcast. Yes. But the book was 736 pages and three yep. and a half pounds. And I only read it because I had jury duty. <laughs> and and um, and it just it made my day. Yeah. Uh, but also similar to to the others I mentioned, I turned it into one chapter and then he he checked it for me and made sure it was right. a good synopsis of his work. But and I managed to I managed to add a few new metaphors of my own. He's he's such an expert at the unending long metaphor. You know, imagine right. if everyone was forced to eat dessert, if every restaurant was forced to provide dessert for free with every meal and he, you know, does a thought experiment and takes it down the, the path. I remember I noticed uh, I think it was in his writing, but I noticed somewhere that um, in a number of municipalities, um, the number of parking spaces you have to provide for a swimming pool is based on the number of gallons of water in the pool. Right. Uh, and I commented as if uh, people were stacking on t top of each other, like in a box of chocolate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but finding those fun, finding those fun analogies is always useful. Um, clearly, uh, you know, bikes deserved its own chapter. Uh, trees deserve their own chapter, which I'm expanding on in my work right now quite a bit. Okay. Um, and this generally is is further organized according to what I call my my four step my four steps of I don't know if I call them steps, but I basically I have my general theory of walkability, right? right? That yep. says in America, really anywhere, but particularly in America in which driving is so cheap and so easy and you fall into the car and it's there in the driveway between you and everything else. And it's right. dr dramatically subsidized, right? Yeah. Every mile costs less than the mile before. If you own a typical American sedan, which almost no one does anymore because they all have SUVs, but I'm sure it's very similar. Four-fifths of the cost of, of driving is just owning the car and only right. one-fifth is driving the car. So the fixed costs are huge. The, 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 the variable costs are are small. And so the smart thing is to drive a ton. In those circumstances, how do you get people to make the choice to walk? And the answer is the walk has to be useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. Thank you. But if you go back to those chapters, actually, um, that list we were looking at, mm -hmm. um, those are further grouped uh, under these four headings. Right. So, um, uh, you know, protecting the pedestrian and um, uh, putting the car in its place is really about safe streets. Um, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, putting cars in their place, that's kind of, um, that's like on top of everything. But mixing the uses and getting parking right and letting transit work, those are all about making a useful city. Right. Protecting the pedestrian and welcoming bikes is about making a safe city. Shaping the spaces and planting trees are about making a comfortable city. And then finally, friendly and unique faces. And then um, the friendly and unique faces is about making an uh, interesting city. And then there's a whole separate issue um, called urban triage, which is basically saying, Start where you can be excellent and move right. outward from there because because unfortunately you have to do all four of these things at, things at once right. or right. you won't succeed. Um, and that's a little bit of a controversial topic because we believe in equitable distribution. But right. um, really you should have concentrated place-based distribution with an eye to equity. Right. But thinking about places first as opposed to uh, categories that you want to satisfy independently of each other. Yeah. I should say that this book is – very um, much in the forefront of my mind now because I've just completed um, a week ago. I handed in a hundred new pages of text. Oh wow! So in in the vein of this conversation, right? When do I feel I need to write a new book? It's just when there's yeah. more to say. Right, right, right. And there's so much more to say. So much has happened in the last ten years. Uh, yeah, and yeah, coincidentally, no, sure. coincidentally, we're coming up in November on the tenth anniversary of this book. So like, like Suburban Nation, which sold very well, and the publisher said, let's do a 10th right. anniversary reissue, and Andres right. and Liz and I wrote some new material for the front, and right. we changed the cover and other things. Yeah. Um, in, in this case, the publisher said, yes, we want to do a 10th anniversary reissue. And I said, okay, but can I add um, a forward? <laughs> now, it turned out to be, I was saying in the forward, like all good forwards, you shouldn't read this until you finish the book. So read it last. And then we decide, okay, we'll call it an update and we'll put it at the end. Okay. So I've added an update. And actually, there's a new forward. Uh, I got Jeanette Sadek Khan to write uh, a forward. Oh, nice. Nice. So, and that's fairly short. I mean, it's, it's not short, but it's not long. And right. that, that appears first. And she kind of places the book in its historical context. Then 
the book is unchanged because it is an artifact that I think needs to be maintained. Um, and then there's a hundred new pages at the end uh, on all the things that have happened in yeah. the last uh, in the in the last ten years. And I would tell your your listeners, you know, this podcast is a great opportunity for me to sell this book. I would actually say wait, right? Buy buy Walkable City Rules now, right? Because yeah. it has a ton of stuff you're going to over here. Get want. this one now, <laughs> yeah. But actually. Don't buy. Nobody buy that book. Nobody yeah. buy Walkable City from now until November. Yeah. Because in November, the book will be unchanged with the addition right. of 100 new pages about Uber, about AVs, about COVID, about Black Lives Matter, about uh, uh, the color of law, about, um, you know, 10 other things. And I, I should say the chapter in Walkable City that's the most out of date by, by, by necessity is the bikes chapter. Right, yeah. So I really have to update the bikes chapter to talk about how much more we've learned and how much better we're doing now in terms of the uh, um, you know, facilities that we're putting in streets. And then I should say I have a ton to add in the trees chapter because I just completed um, about six, no, about four months ago um, a massive urban forestry plan for Cedar Rapids, Iowa, okay. which less than two years ago suffered the worst urban tree loss storm event in American history. They lost two thirds of their canopy, 670,000 trees wow. in oh 70 gosh. minutes yeah. when a, a derecho, a, a straight windstorm right. came through town. Right. Its epicenter was Cedar Rapids. This is a city with, um, uh, a tree on it, you know, it, it's called the Emerald City. Its city logo is a tree. Um, you know, it's a city that prides itself on its greenery and uh, it's naked as a as a newborn right now. Yeah. It's very sad. And uh, we've mounted this huge effort. It's a $40 million effort, a 10-year effort to bring back all the trees that are lost. The $40 million is just the public side. There'll be you know, necessarily a lot of private work as well. Um, but in doing that plan with landscape architects, I learned a ton about about trees that I didn't know before, and, and that was missing, I yeah. think, from the earlier version. So I'm I'm enjoyed the opportunity to talk about that too. Yeah. The um, I, I went back and looked at the uh, the chapters, multiple chapters uh, in the section on bikes uh, in, in the 101 steps and. Um, I can even see sections of that that are already kind of outdated now that what's happened even just in the last yeah. handful of years. Um, and I'm going to pull up an image I don't, here. I don't come out and say, I don't come out and say Shiro's are bad, for example. No, you don't. I'm yeah. not a, I, I yeah. wasn't a big fan of Shiro's, but I didn't come out. I mean, but I wasn't, I wasn't against them. And um, now we know that Shiro's make streets less safe, for example. The way right, we so do them, the, the way we approach them in the in North America, yes, absolutely. Um, right. One of the things that you know that the Dutch understand in terms of their the delineation when they look at their network is the fact that yes, you have your your protected and your separated portions of the network, but seventy percent of their network is actually shared space. Yeah, it's, it's not it's, Shiro's in an unsafe space. It's a yeah. space in which everyone is driving. Uh, they're not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily call them all Wunerfs, but they're all right. spaces in which speeds are so low. And of course, I've I've biked in Copenhagen with my family. Sure. And uh, yeah, there's two types of facilities. And 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 one of the first realizations you have when you're there is, oh my gosh, I'm in a city street, but I'm dominant right. in that street yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a bicyclist. In fact, the only real danger is the cross bicycle traffic, which I need to watch out for. Right. Um, because and, cars and are, are. You bring up Copenhagen is a, is a great example for North American city because their roadways are much more analogous in most of the situations, especially over the major bridges, to what we typically see in North America. Now, Cambridge, yeah. Massachusetts is a city that. Um, that is influenced extensively by Copenhagen. Um, Kara Siderman, uh, you know, lives over there or lived over there in Copenhagen. And I think she still has a place there and is constantly going back and forth. And so walk us through what's going on here, because this is one of my favorite facilities in North America, because it proves that you can do this. Talk so, a little bit um, about this. 
Well, slight correction, if you'll forgive me. There are bike lanes that look exactly like that in Cambridge, and they're using the same standard. That yeah. picture happens to be Somerville. Well, which is right. And that picture was yeah. yeah, yeah. And that picture yeah. was given to me by George Proakis, uh -huh. uh, a longtime new urbanist, super smart guy. He actually co-teaches my Harvard class every summer. Right. June thirteenth through fourteenth this year, and yeah. we'll talk to your audience about that. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, he's now in the position overseeing planning. Uh, Sarah Lewis, another new urbanist, is the planning director in Somerville. But they're putting these in uh, all over the place. Cambridge is putting them in. Cambridge has a law on the books that you can't actually repave a street without putting in some sort of bike facility, which right. is fantastic. And um, protected but, bike facility. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is what you can do if you're rebuilding a curb. Right. If you're not rebuilding a curb, then you find ways, as I do in my own work, for example, to pull those cars off the curb and put a bike lane in the street, which is protected by the parked cars and a door buffer. Right. But when you're building new edges, as I'm doing in a project in Newton, Mass, right now, this is the new standard. So we're doing a project at the Riverside stop at the Green Line in Newton, and uh, there will be a bike lane, a bike facility in the major street, Grove Street, that runs alongside it. And we're going to be using essentially the same standard as this one, which is which is curb, a little space for the door, bike lane, a little separation space, which um, uh, should have trees in it or something else. Yeah. There are different ways to, throw, there are different places to throw the trees in, this, in these schemes. There are different solutions, which have trees on one edge or the other edge or both, perhaps staggered, yeah. staggered diagonally, right? Yeah. Um, but this is... You know, this is what I was biking on in Berlin in the 90s, right? Right. This is not unusual. It's just unusual in America. Yeah. But the pro more progressive cities are are providing them. And, of course, this, these are cities that already have large biking populations, but which are growing dramatically based on on uh, on these investments. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. So, and yeah. one of the things that I loved about the Cambridge example um, was the fact that they were also working on perfecting the quick build of a continuous elevation of the crosswalk and the and the the cycle path uh, when yeah. it crosses some of those minor streets. Is that also a feature of the Somerville uh, installation as well? Uh, some of them, I believe, maybe not all, but they're they're okay. certainly. Getting the best consultants to to do it. To I, I'm to not do I'm not remembering the exact details, but yeah, they're yeah. they're um they're not some reels not behind Cambridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, they're 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 right on top of it. I I enjoy. In fact, I. Uh, have quite a bit of footage from um, from Somerville when I was uh, when I was there filming. So it's good stuff. Um, so I'm going to pull up the uh, what you just uh, mentioned, which is the class that is coming up here oh, in uh, just a few weeks. Uh, so walk us through uh, what what's going on here with this uh, this fun little uh, gathering. I will walk you through my <laughs> class. Um, so I've been doing this now. With the, with the gap for COVID, I've been doing this now for maybe 10 years. Okay. Uh, at least eight. And uh, it's a two-day class. And it's essentially the one time a year that I get to give a eight-hour lecture. Right. And uh, it sounds boring, but if I can say this to your audience, it is consistently the highest rated class at, at the Harvard uh, um, a summer program, <laughs> yeah. or at least at least tied for that, um, and uh, people really enjoy enjoy it. Um, in part because the first day is basically, you know, it's my standard one hour lecture, but it's everything I can possibly say about it because I literally have eight hours, maybe seven, to just tell every story, uh, remember every anecdote, cite every exception, and just just it's a brain dump. So right. it's an eight hour brain dump. Then the next day. Uh, because I represent the private consultant side, the next day George Proakis comes in for the morning and he talks about his experience being a progressive city planner for a municipality, Somerville, oh, fantastic. which has been uh, exceptional in pushing, pushing forward plans like Summer Vision, their own uh, ideas of, of uh, successful ideas to make their city more walkable and livable. Then we tour, because there's some really nice new urbanist projects in the area, like Assembly Row, where we end up having lunch, Mm -hmm. uh, in Somerville, but we tour uh, about three different projects in Somerville, including a site at, at Gilman Square, which is one of three new Green Line T stops where I did station area planning around um, maybe eight years ago. And the T just arrived right. uh, maybe a month ago at these new stops. And the class does a design exercise where we ask you to 
um, do what I did, right? right to right. without seeing, without cheating, and seeing the plan that we did to make a plan for this location based on every, based on everything you've learned in the class. And yeah. so, the, the the after lunch, after we get back to the studio, the students do that for a couple hours until the time is up, and then we present our plans to each other. But it's a wonderful two day course. It's it'll be so nice to get back to it after a couple years away, um, and it isn't cheap because it's Harvard and you have to get to Boston. Oh, oh, I forgot to say the evening of the first, like I'm not allowed to have any programming off campus. It's just not allowed, but I have an informal event. Okay. The, the, the first night we then, you know, call it a day. We're all done. Anyone who wants to leave can, and nobody does. And we hop on the T, we go to Park Street Station in the heart of Boston. I give a tour of Beacon Hill, Back Bay, South oh, End. Nice, and we nice. end up all having dinner together in the South End. Uh, so that's a wonderful part of the class as well. Nice. But I wanted to say that, that um, you know, it's not cheap, but when you're done, you actually get a piece of paper uh, from the university that looks like you graduated from Harvard. So it's worth every penny. You can hang that behind your yeah. desk and impress <laughs> your, uh, your colleagues. Ah, tempting, tempting. Well, I'm going to scroll up here so that po folks can see, you know, the program description. It's and... usually about, uh, it's usually about 20 people. So it's not, okay. it's not a huge class and everyone has an opportunity to, to engage Fantastic. One -on -one. Any any notable graduates uh, that have gone on to do some things that we might know about? Um, well, I got a call from one of them or an email a few months ago who's a who's a prince in Bahrain. I didn't know he was a prince in Bahrain when he was taking wow. the class. Cool. Um, but uh, a number of prominent urbanists, including some who really shouldn't have needed it, right, uh, have taken the class. Maybe just to hang out and have fun uh, yeah. with me and my and my colleagues. But um, I don't have a list handy, but but certainly it, it tends to be designers okay. and it tends to be people who are um, either um, establishing their career, actually at every phase in their career, establishing okay. their career in the middle of their career. And some, some people are just winding down and they want to be entertained. Um, but uh, it's, it's always a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good stuff. I'm going to pop over to your website so that we can uh, at least, uh, you know, make that landing here. Uh, of course, I'll have the, uh, the, the, the links in the show notes and in the video description as well. And uh, you're looking very, very serious. And, and uh, that was uh, in uh, gave a talk there. in um, Greensboro. Huh? OK. Um, and that was the um, no Greenville. Okay. Right. Famous for its main street. Is that that's South Carolina, right? The Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina. South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That it was, has, it has yeah, a, that was mile, a major, major redo yeah. of a, of a main street that was previously like a highway. Yeah. It has a full mile. That's beautifully walkable. Yeah. And that, that was just the photographer who shot me there and he did a great job. So that's my picture now. Um, there's this wonderful video that's being made. Okay. Um, about my mission to make America more walkable and I keep telling them it has to stop, you know, don't let it read like an ad for my firm. It really needs to be a hard hitting, <laughs> right. serious documentary, which it is. And you'll right. see. Um, right. But what you'll find on my website is a 12 minute clip that's pretty compelling. OK. And that's uh, what this and is. And then um, uh, my website has and, and by the way, it's just jeffspeck.com. So it's very right. easy to find. Yeah. But it has all my it has all my past projects as projects when I was at DPZ. OK. Unlike other professionals, I make it very clear which projects I did. Well, not at my own firm. <laughs> right. Okay. Got it. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and then a ton of, would you mind going back? I don't know if you have. If oh you yeah, have no, totally. Me, yeah. But we can totally go, go back. If you scroll down, there's just a ton of tremendous resources. Uh, keep going. Just go more and more and more um, to the videos. So first I show projects I've done, types of projects, and then selected projects of my own firm. And then keep going. Uh, projects done. Um, ah, yeah, all stop the there. talks, yeah. Um, projects below or projects I did at DPZ, et cetera. But yeah. um, there's a couple, there's three TED Talks. There's just a whole bunch of project videos, pan down a little bit more, um, and um, uh, and just various, you know, what, what yeah. I feel are like the best the best ways to communicate this message. Fantastic. And, and, and uh, no need to end, but the, the way I would summarize my role in the movement, I think, is um, – as the scribe, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tend to get a lot of credit for these ideas right. because I wrote them down. Um, you know, when Suburban Nation came out, 
the, the cover said Andre Stuani, Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, Jeff Speck. Right. Every, a lot of people who didn't know thought that we were like the three creators of this idea when they were the teachers and I was the student. And I benefited tremendously from that. And I'm not ignorant of how lucky I am. Um, similarly, you know, I mean, I do these projects and I think I'm a good urban designer, but, but what I, what I hope has been my principal contribution is just disseminating this information to the most people I can, as well as I can to just win over as many as hearts, uh, many hearts and minds as possible to grow this movement. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to jump over here to uh, this particular uh, design, this particular graphic that's on here, and and, uh, and ask you, when is this going to get built? When is this Shangri-La going to happen? Oh, it's built. Happen? It's you done. Know, you know that looks, I know that. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, good one. So one of, my um, and, favorite, one of my favorite videos that I've produced this year was uh, spending time in Carmel, Indiana, and rolling right. down Monon Boulevard and, and filming this. And I actually rode there from Indianapolis because I was shooting some film and, and creating a video of the... Uh, uh, the Indianapolis Cultural Trail, and then I continued and, yeah. down uh, Monon to to do this. Talk a little bit about this project. This is a really really special project. I love this project, and and its uh, strength come from its strength comes from uh, after I was done being uh, taken over the landscape architecture by by Jan Gale's company. Right. So Mayor Brainerd in Carmel, who's an incredible leader. Um, is a design junkie and a design firm junkie, and he'll bring in anyone who will work with him who he sees as innovative. And so uh, I created the plan, which I can tell you about, but uh, Jan Gale's firm took my plan and changed it, mm -hmm. um, not in ways that change its function, but I think they made it a lot prettier and a lot sexier and, um, and nicer. Um, this is a very unusual circumstance where a trail, a rails to trail trail called the Monon Trail that runs from north of Carmel all the way to Indianapolis was passing through the middle of this community in an area that was kind of quasi-industrial and not well utilized. But it happened to be the half mile that was separating their main street, which right. is called the Art and Design Art and Design District, and a, a lovely, um, you know, mid-century American Main Street with the Civic Center to its south, which has a David Schwartz performance hall and a nice city hall and um, a number of other buildings. And in between these two things, which ostensibly were walkable, no one was walking uh, because there was no real urbanism. A lot of people were jogging or biking in their exercise routes on this path, but, right. but yeah. exclusive of them, no one was using it. So the goal right. was to, to knit the, the community together but I have to say, when I arrived, there were four previous plans that had been rejected. Right, right. And uh, the city had paid four different planners. And I said to the mayor, I said, look, I know you're going to pay me, but I really, I don't want to work on this if I'm just going to be the fifth rejected plan. And he right. said, well, let's, let's see where it goes. <laughs> and um, all the previous plans had respected the trail too much. Right. Um, doing anything that would perhaps undermine the uh, the strictly linear high uh, recreational speed use of that trail, and my immediate reaction, which which strangely no one else had had, was that trail can be the middle of a boulevard. Why don't we use the trail as a uh, as an urban heart to a linear corridor and build city around it? Right. So my scheme, which wasn't exactly like this scheme, but was quite similar takes the trail, it puts it in the, in the median of a boulevard. The boulevard is only one lane in each direction. It's uh, one lane plus a, an edge of parking, which is very useful to the, to the businesses along it. Um, you'll see here that, that Gail's firm went even beyond my plan, which has a bike trail and pedestrian trails in the center and added a bike trail, bike, additional bike lanes on the edges. So you kind of have your, your, your bike highway in the middle and your bike uh, uh, avenue uh, on the edges. Uh, and of course, ample sidewalks and lots of trees and everything else. But what's remarkable is that, um, you know, this was largely one or two story um, aluminum or cinder block buildings or nothing, you know, oh, nothing, or lumber yeah. yards and other yeah. things. And this limited investment by the city, it's one of these classic urban design solutions where a very limited investment by the city has caused a tremendous amount of private investment surrounding it. And now it's almost entirely flanked. 
um, by these five and six story buildings. I actually just completed a plan for the southernmost portion of this um, that will further uh, develop that area. So it's Fantastic. a real it's a real um, example, I think, of how urbanism is always about not making choices, but about including everything. Right. And right. the most urban places are the places that have the most of everything. And right. so my instinct as a planner, which I learned from the best, I would say, is um, not to separate, but to to combine and to use amenities as the heart of uh, public spaces, which are mostly our streets. Right. Now, Carmel is famous or infamous, depending on <laughs> your, your perspective, for roundabouts. Where do you come down on roundabouts the way that North America is, is going about it, which is dramatically different from the way that the, the Dutch approach roundabouts? So, uh, and I'm not that familiar with Dutch roundabouts. I don't think I've been in one. Okay. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen pictures, of course. Uh, one of my rules in Walkable City Rules is to do roundabouts properly and with discretion. Uh, Mayor Brainerd has built 140 roundabouts, right. I believe, in Carmel. Um, I think the way that he's used them is appropriate. I think that roundabouts are tremendous for suburban car-centric places. And most right. of Carmel is car-centric and suburban. He was wise to not put any roundabouts at any of his main, main commercial intersections. They're always in more suburban locations. And there is one on the main street, but it's kind of where the main street ends. Right. Roundabouts are safe. Uh, American modern roundabouts, you know, when there's an accident, you don't call the um, ambulance, you call the tow truck, they like to say. Right. And um, uh, they allow pedestrians and cars to co-inhabit, co cohabit rather well, um, but they don't feel walkable. They don't feel pedestrian because they're dynamic. They're a swoopy shape. Yep. Wherever you have swoops, you're communicating a landscape that's automotive and not pedestrian. They require the pedestrian to go off axis. How far off axis depends on the roundabout, but there's usually you know, at least 20 feet of, uh, gee, I have to go right to then go left again, and pedestrians hate doing that. Um, I like to say that a roundabout is the safest, most pedestrian-friendly automotive environment that you can create. But it's still it's still an automotive environment. It's still an automo automotive. Yeah. Environment. So I'll, yeah. I'll I'll use them when in, in when I'm working in Carmel. I'll, I'll put them in my plans, but only at the edges of things. Right. Never at the middle. We did at DPZ. We did a downtown master plan for uh, Sarasota, which right. was tremendously impactful and really reformed that downtown beautifully, but they stuck in a couple roundabouts right on the main street that were never in our plan. And I think those worked to the detriment of the downtown. Yeah. Um, what would be much more walkable just as an always stop uh, is, uh, is a roundabout that most pedestrians jaywalk right through the middle of if they can, which is not safe. Right. Um, and which just doesn't feel all that urban. I want to uh, s jump over to uh, a another slide that's actually from your deck here, and it's actually a, a release that came out fairly recently. And um, and 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 have you just kind of reflect upon uh, what we're looking at here, and and what are your uh, you know thoughts on this? Well, I mean, this is the Federal Highway Administration, right? So that's right. ostensibly, they have a good budget. And they have access to the best minds in the country. And yep. certainly some of the best minds in the country have made an effort to infiltrate. And now they're, I guess, wouldn't they be underneath Pete Buttigieg? Aren't they, yep. aren't they a department Absolutely. that he oversees? Yeah, yep. USDOT. <clears throat> and, Pete, and Pete Buttigieg did great stuff uh, with some great designers uh, making South Bend more walkable and bikeable. Yep. Uh, he did something that I do in many of the cities I work in, which was to turn a, a system of multi-lane one ways back to two-way travel. Right. which um, it was a mistake to do that in so many cities and every city that reverts it. And there are about 80 that have done it so far um, uh, is happy about it. No one ever regrets um, doing that work. In any case, so uh, uh, if you were in my talk at CNU, I was just kind of shaking my head or I had my head in my hands just about the quality of this image. Yeah. Um, the, the um, you know, just the amateur uh, nature of it. But moreover, first of all, we now know that you should never do a four lane street. Right. Four lane streets are what we now turn to three lanes with the classic American road diet because a three lane street right. with a center turn lane handles 
just as many trips as a four lane street. And we've proved that over and over again. I have a list of about 23 of them. I think that four was literally the tweet that I, that I sent out when yeah. I saw this image. <laughs> yeah. So first of all, if you know anything about street design, you wouldn't do a four laner. Right. Secondly, um, I've since corrected myself. I think there is a slight curb where that grass is, right? So that bike lane sure. is, is up on a curb. Yeah. Yeah. But but where are the trees? Like, how is it a complete street without street right. trees? And we're right. so desperate for for shade and for our, our ecosystem to be healed. Um, who would call it a complete street without trees? Both both for the sake of our of our environment, but also to give comfort to pedestrians. Yeah. Um, so it was just not a very strong showing, and it was a little too easy to troll. Uh, but I am concerned. Yeah, <laughs> I am too. And, you know, the very first thing that I thought of when I saw that image was uh, was first a, yeah, uh, excuse me, a, a four lane. And the second thing was it it reminded me of of something that Chuck Marone um, used to say about complete streets and sort of his his like criticism of it, of saying you know, it, it feels like they're just trying to to check off the tick marks of saying, yeah, we've got a I little guess bit in of the fun. We've got a little bit of this. We've got a little bit of that. Let's 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 just say, you know, oh, we're we're complete. We have the strip of yeah. of uh, you know sidewalk, the strip of of bicycle facility. There, it's complete. Yeah, and Walk so many away. of them, so many of them are, um, you know, blatant negligent endangerment. Right. Of the pedestrians and cyclists that you're ostensibly inviting into that deadly environment with well, that and, striping. And, and basically Chuck said that, you know, a couple of weeks ago in at CNU is, you know, in, in his uh, panel discussion, you know, he he brought up the definition of gross negligence. Yeah. And I do, too. And, and I loved I loved reading this book. And I uh, everywhere I speak, I show this image um, and yes. tell people they need to they need to read it. It is such an important book. And it really strips away all of the confusion uh, and makes it very clear that as a profession, traffic engineering in the U.S. is grossly criminally negligent. Right. Is uh, destined, as Jane Jacobs said, to um, reproduce empirical failure and ignore empirical success. Yeah. And um, as I say in my text that's coming out in November, you know, when can we sue? Yeah. When can we when can we mount that massive class action lawsuit? And I should say, and if you could put it in the show notes, um, when this book came out, I was so excited reading it that I asked Chuck if I could go on his show and interview him about the book. So I was on yes. Chuck's show maybe maybe five months ago, and we had a conversation about this book that that I think your audience would find uh, enlightening. Um, it wasn't just you know log rolling and us complimenting each other. It was a right. pretty deep conversation about. Technically, what can we do to change a profession that is um, deeply responsible for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of excess deaths? Let's say tens of thousands of excess deaths every year. Um, I'm now reading the book, um, Is It There, oh, there Are No Accidents yes. by Jesse Singer. Yep. Uh, Jesse Singer, There Are No Accidents. I'm, I'm a third of the way through that book as well. Super important, uh, uh, hammering on the same issue, which is essentially... We make decisions in the way that we design our places yep. and the way and our policies and the way we maintain our places, but principally design um, that admits that we believe that certain people are expendable. Yeah. And wouldn't you know it, the people who are getting injured the most and dying the most are the um, most disadvantaged people in the yeah. society. And, 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 I, you know, and, the, and just to, to add on to that is, you know, and what I love about Jesse's book, too, is it it's not just about transportation uh, yeah. and mobility. I mean, it's it's certainly what happened to her and to her friend, you know, kind of led her in this direction. And, you know, and she goes into that in detail and she'll be a future guest here on the podcast as well. Good. Um, Good. But Good. It, it really does dive deeper into, you know, the fact that we call these things accidents and they're not accidents yeah. and, it, and it cuts across many, many different dimensions of our human uh, experiment, as you will. Uh, I think she's, the, she's the Ralph Nader of, of our generation and yeah. her voice is really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Jeff, 
Is there anything that we haven't yet discussed that you really want to leave the audience with? Thinking. Um, a number of things that I'm getting involved in. I honestly think the cul-de-sac experiment is really important. Okay. And I don't know if your, if your uh, audience knows much about it, but cul-de-sac is some young, some young kids out of Arizona, okay. University of Arizona, who they're not that young anymore, who made money in, in tech and decided why do people have to live with cars and let's create a new community in Tempe to start. Right which the first phase sold out instantly in Tempe where everyone drives yeah. um, a thousand units um, on like 17 acres of uh, homes with zero parking. Right. There's parking for the retail uh, at the square, but there's the, none of the streets are drivable. And uh, this is a conversation I have with a lot of my clients and I'm having with them because we found each other. It turns out that, that they were, they knew my work and, I tweeted something like, the only thing that kills me about cul-de-sac is I had nothing to do with it because it's so <laughs> damn good. Opticos design. So uh, we're talking now and um, yeah. they're involving me in some of their other projects, but they really want to uh, turn this into a, a national or international thing. And they certainly have the yeah. funding to do that. Um, and funders that I know that I work with, they're interested in, in working with them. But <clears throat> I have a number of developer clients who are working in cities that aren't like Tempe, but cities like Somerville. Yeah. Or Cambridge, yeah. where you just have to accept that in any given market, there's a certain percentage. It might be 5%, it might be 50%, but there's a certain percentage of people who don't want to own a car. Right. Um, they're currently not being properly served. If you create a new development of, you know, 500 homes, 1,000 homes, depends on the size of the city. Mm -hmm. However many homes you put there, that's a lot fewer people than exist in that metropolis that want to live car free. Right. Moreover, with the proper marketing mechanism, which cul-de-sac has, yeah. you can get almost all of them to buy into your community. Yeah. And then there's the whole social infrastructure that grows up around these like-minded people, pretty you know, young or young at heart, who chose choose to live in this crunchy, uh, you know, slightly progressive. Or, or quite progressive environment. I think it's a model that could go in almost every housing market. So I'm super excited yeah. about that. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about suing the engineers, although I don't know who and who's going to do it and how. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested in, in reforming the APA. I think the APA is a American planning association, which certifies planners as AICP. It doesn't make you say anything about, sprawl. I mean, you have an ethics, you have a whole bunch of ethics rules you have to satisfy. Right. And God help you if you do something that's ethically wrong, you know, you, you lose your, your ability to, to be AICP. Um, but no one's ever asked to, to not, to, to say that they won't do the equivalent of using leeches and bleeding patients, right. which for me is building, building single use sprawl yeah. or putting a parking lot in front of a building. Yeah. Like in, in a walkable transit served environment, as a planner, you should be willing to pledge that you won't put a parking lot in front of a building, that it has to go behind. Yeah. So in my new book, I have a, I have a, uh, it's a fake, a fake letter from the American Planning Association apologizing for 70 years of sprawl and uh, creating an amendment to the ethics um, rules uh, that says we won't be building sprawl anymore. I call it the planner's pledge. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see where that goes. Probably nowhere, but a um, do no harm I, clause. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so, I, so, I, so I have one final question for you. So um, we just got back from Oklahoma City. Uh, so you had that opportunity to spend you know, multiple days there, uh, you know, for the Congress. What are your what are your thoughts now? You know, because that project was quite some time ago, and uh, that was one of the areas where you helped with those some of those one way street conversions. And, and what, yeah. what what do you kind of now that the dust has kind of settled on that experience that week? All the urbanists there. I think you probably stayed there a few days afterwards. Um, now that all that dust has settled, what are some of the things that that bubble up for you about uh, where Oklahoma City is right now? Well, I think the fact that no one came up to me and accosted me about the flaws uh, just shows how good-natured people are and 
what a friendly bunch we are. Um, <laughs> but not a single person took me aside and said, Jeff, this could have been better. Maybe that's because in, in our plenary, when I presented it, I said, this I know it could have been, been better. better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was covering my ass. But the, the fact is that, you know, we haven't discussed it here today. When Mayor Cornette came to me around 2010 or so and said, uh, you know, we've been na named the least walkable city, the, the worst city for pedestrians in America, what can we do? And I mounted my first ever walkability study, and that led to the redesign of, of every street in a 50 block downtown core. Right. <clears throat> I should note, not all of which has been built. There's still plenty of streets like Broadway, which haven't seen the, Correct. the plans impact yet. But a lot of it was built. Um, and it was built according to the best standards that we could get across in the early 2000s. So, for example, the bike lanes aren't protected right. um, and, um, you know, some of the details aren't great. But there's street trees consistently everywhere. The materials are all great. Um, it basically, you know, and my other main point from the presentation and, and what Mick Cornette said and what the current mayor also said, everyone was stressed, was you should have seen it before because it was so <laughs> It was so bad. Literally. <laughs> literally six lane one way streets running through the downtown that we turned into two to three lane two way right. streets and put in more parking. I doubled the, num the number of on street parking spaces. I added a bike network when there was no bike network and we did other things. Yeah. Um, and I worked with the office of Jim Burnett, OJB, who famously did Clyde Warren Park in Dallas, that park that sits on top of the highway. Right. Um, and they did a fantastic job with the public spaces and also with the streetscape uh, in that team. Um, but uh, I think that... Um, you know, it makes me realize how fast our technology is advancing, how yeah. uh, we really need to work hard to make sure we're using the best, latest details, because you will it will it might take five to 10 years to build it and then you'll be well behind. Um, and uh, also, I was struck in Oklahoma City, like, I think, as a lot of people are, um, particularly in office heavy downtowns like yeah. Des Moines, Omaha, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, how covid really emptied them out and made them feel quite dead. And I, I yeah. think that will be somewhat reversed, but it puts all the more pressure on another thing that the walkability study advocated, which is we need as much housing downtown as possible. American right. downtowns are not, do not, as Jane Jacobs said in the early sixties, American downtowns do not have an adequate amount of housing to match the businesses to get that time spread of activity during the day and during the night that makes a place really successful. So right. um, there were a lot of lessons, but all in all, having not seen it myself mm -hmm. since uh, almost nothing was built, I, I was pretty satisfied in the context of, of knowing what it had been like before. Yeah, yeah. So I did a, a series of five videos um, on uh, my experience there. Uh, earlier today, I published uh, and, and did a premiere of the fifth video, which was uh, uh, Victor Dover giving a tour of the Wheeler District. And so I, I got him on film. Um, the third video that I did was actually an evaluation of making it from the downtown area to the Wheeler District on a bike. I, did, I so, took that walk. Oh, I, I did it. I, this is on bike. And so I took three different routes uh, by bike to evaluate the bikeability. Um, and I was pretty gracious of saying that I understand that much of what is on the ground now uh, was designed, you know, years ago. And, uh, yeah. and, and clearly also, doesn't make also, me what we both are saying is is now the acceptable, acceptable all ages and abilities standard. Right. Yeah. But also the the downtown plan for the streets of Oklahoma City was like a seven by seven grid. Right. So you you leave that grid almost immediately on your walk to the Wheeler District, exactly. which is a solid, a solid what two and a half miles away. Yeah. And I walked it on a, at midday to have lunch with the developer. Yeah. Uh, and I really enjoyed that project as well. And your audience should check it out because I think it's great. Yeah. Um. But um. You know that's that's a connection that no one ever, um, thought about making. Yeah. Um. Uh, but the developers are are um, determined to make it better. Yep. I think it's it's the sort of distance that almost nobody walks. So improving the transit connections and improving the biking connections are going to yes. be really important. Yeah, it's inherently another, bike another bike. lesson. Yeah, no, just not to go too far afield. Another lesson from Oklahoma City was they they did their um, they did their light rail wrong. Uh, okay. They allowed they allowed um, political uh, fact factors to determine the path of a train okay. that now doesn't doesn't run directly and doesn't connect the things it needs to. 
um, and um, fully. And as a result, almost nobody, almost nobody uses it. I and that's didn't see a single person on <laughs> the whole week yeah. I was there. <laughs> that was subsequent to my involvement. It's nice that they have a have a, a train, but um, that was an example of how you can't let the political process drive yeah. the the routing of transit systems. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Jeff, it has been such an honor and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Back at you. This was a lot of fun. And um, uh, I look forward to seeing it myself and sharing it with my with, with my various friends. Um, and thank you for what you do. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Jeff Speck. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just click on the subscribe button down below, ring that bell, and indicate what your notifications preferences might be. And also, I'd be delighted to have you pop on over to the Active Town store to check out some of the fun and zany uh, stuff I have out there, you know, like Streets are for People, uh, Schwag. And finally, if you're finding value from the content that I'm creating, please consider supporting me on Patreon, and that's just at patreon.com slash active towns. Thank you all so much for tuning in and providing whatever support you can. I really appreciate it. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.